Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of SEPAD Pod, the sectarianism proxies and desectarianization podcast based at Lancaster University. Today, I'm joined by Ahmed Kuru, professor of political science and the former director of the Center for Islamic and Arabic Studies at San Diego State University. Ahmed is the author of an absolutely wonderful book, Islam, Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment, a global historical companion comparison, I should say, published by Cambridge very recently. He's the author of a number of other books on Islam and, and the relationship between religion and politics. And as a consequence, he's the absolutely the, the perfect sort of person that we should get onto this podcast. So, Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Simon. I'm, I'm very happy to be in your very important and timely podcast series. That's very kind of you to say, Ahmed. Thank you. So I've got a number of questions. And my, my first question is is usually asking about how you got interested in, in this topic. But having read uh, your book or working my way through your book, I should say, you open the book with a little story. So I wonder, can you just recount that story about the conversation that you had with your with your father, please? Yeah, of course, of course. So three decades ago, I was in Iskenderun in the Mediterranean coastal area of Turkey. And in the morning, in the breakfast, my father seemed upset. Then I wonder and ask why. Then my mom explained that a night before, we were hosting uh, an army general in our house because my father was a local politician and whomever come to visit our town, he generally invited for a dinner. And after I went back to my bed for sleep, the conversation came to the issue of Muslim underdevelopment. And the general was very secularist, and he argued that Muslim nations are all consumers of civilization, and it's only Protestant nations who contributed to civilization. And my father was a, a right-wing politician, a moderate right-wing, and he explained that to the general that Muslims contributed to mathematics, medical science in their early history. But the conversation was very tense, and the Kemal's general and my father had a debate. That's the reason my father was upset in the breakfast. So that really intrigued me and make me wonder about this issue. And I checked my father's library, he had a big one. Then I read a book about the rise of industrial revolution in Western Europe. Read the book, came back to my father and said, aha, I understood how the Western Europeans passed us, us at the time means the Ottomans and the Turks and other Muslims probably. And then my father had a compassionate smile on his face and mm -hmm. taught me that Ahmed, you had to read at least 10 to 15 more books to say something, say that conclusively. So that was the initial interest in me. And that's why I dedicated the book to my father. That's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful dedication and, and incredibly inspiring to, to, to see. And I, I love the little story that, that opens the book. And it, it demonstrates the power of intellectual curiosity, I think. But... It, did that prompt your your journey into academia? Then was that was that the moment that that really made you decide that you wanted to go and pursue this this line of thing thing more more seriously? Yes and no. Yes, uh, my father's intellectual curiosity and the books and everything encouraged me to pursue an academic career. But more specifically for this book, I have a relatively more recent story, which is that. Ten years ago, my book on secularism was published again by Cambridge University Press with the title Secularism and State Policies Toward Religion, the United States, France and Turkey. So at that time, I was very much interested in the debate between seculars and Islamists in Turkey. At the same time, as you may remember, the Hatzkar debate in yeah. France was tense. Then in the U.S. we have the debate about religious freedom. Then I wrote this comparative work to examine three cases with the comparative angle. Then the book ended with an argument that secularism is not one monolithic type, but there are two main types. Passive secularism, I call 
the one in the United States and in several other Western democracies, where the state is supposed to be passive neutral, whereas in France, in Turkey, in Mexico, and in several other cases, what we see is assertive secularism, in which the state plays an assertive role to exclude religion from the public sphere, to make it exclusively an issue of private life and personal life. So then I argue that in Turkey, you have a very religious society in comparison to France. Therefore, this French laïcité or assertive secularism creates a problem. I propose the American type passive secularism as the solution. So in 2009, I was at Colombia with Alfred Stepan. He passed away. I missed him so much. A big name on comparative politics and mm. recently Islam and democracy. We invited a top Turkish constitutional law professor, Özbudun, who was at the time drafting a constitution for Turkey. Interestingly, the AKP at the time, 10 years ago, agreed that such a secular uh, major professor of law would write, draft a constitution. Today, they wouldn't do that because today AKP has taken a very authoritarian Islamist path, unfortunately. So to make the long story short, this professor came to our conference. He liked my idea. He read the book. He reviewed the book. Then he went and interviewed in Turkey to a major newspapers saying that we'll change the system. Passive secularism will be the new principle in Turkey. Ahmed could have coined the term. That's the solution. So immediately, 10 years ago, Kemalist secularists were very powerful, assertive mm. secularists. They attacked him, they attacked me. Uh, they made my photo in a major newspaper, written Made in USA beneath it. So they accused right. me to be an American plot. Yeah. So then, so the story then turned into an interestingly good way that the Constitutional Court invited me in 2013, saying that they reach a new decision uh, uh, declaring that a more liberal understanding of secularism would be effective in Turkey rather than the strict Kemalist rigid assertive secularism. And the court's vice president at the, at the time, now he's the president of the court, told me that my book inspired them about the decision. So I was very happy. But like all good Hollywood movies, there was a twist. <laughs> the, the dream turned into nightmare. Right. Turkey, instead of a passive secularist democratic country, now is unfortunately taking a path towards Islamist authoritarian one-man rule. That's the point I was thinking that my first book on secularism focuses too much on constitution, on laws, on legality. But the problems are much deeper. Problems are more historical, cultural, societal in the Muslim world. And the Arab Spring also turned into a winter, which further encouraged me to write about the historical problems. That's the story, more recent story, about the new book, Islam, Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment. I really did get into the historical legacy of the problem of authoritarianism that we cannot simply solve by a constitutional court or replacing assertive secularism with passive secularism, the problems are deeper. Sure. So there's there's a real personal dimension to this book then. And that that, that comes out in, in its writing. It it reads as a as a real sort of personal journey, I guess, with this sort of passion that that really does come out at a number of points. So that, that's really interesting to know, Ahmed. And um, I wonder, just before we, we go into the book, can you just tell us a little bit about your, your educational background then? You, you studied politics. Did you study other things? What was, what was the, the main thrust of your education? Yeah, in, 
In Ankara, I attended a, a high school with French medium. So I started to study French before English. Right. Then I attended Bill Kent University for a, business administration and management. When I graduated, I didn't want to earn money. <laughs> <laughs> money is a good thing, but I want. I I was very much interested in politics. I either can do politics as my father did as a politician or choose the more intellectual academic path. I chose the, the latter. And then I came to the University of Utah for master's, then University of Washington, Seattle for PhD. Then at Columbia University, I did my postdoc. Then I've been in teaching at San Diego State University. And during my sabbatical, in 2013, I was a Brookings Fellow at Brookings Doha Institute. Fantastic. Analyzing the Arab Spring at the time. So that's the yeah. short background. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So we'll touch on the Arab the Arab uprisings a bit later on, if I may. Um, I also just want to, to get a very quick understanding of what you mean by passive and assertive secularism, please. You touched on it in the in the previous discussion, but I think it'd be really useful just for, for people to get a sense about these two important concepts before we go on to the book. Definitely. Thank you. So, the, the main focus in my book on secularism was policies about education, because in all three cases, the US, France, and Turkey, both sides, both the secularists and Islamists, or other groups, rather than putting them in dichotomy, I put them in a continuum in the book. There are several groups, obviously. Uh, they debate on education, in more specifically on schools, public schools, private schools, because they want to shape the next generation, the young people, their work views. And that's why, for example, in the U.S., the Pledge of Allegiance, whether it would include one nation under God or not, is a big deal. Mm. And that's why the headscarf issue in both France and Turkey were major reasons for public discussion. Sure. So in Turkey, the policies of Kemalist assertive secularism were even more radical because in France, when I was there in 2004, there were students wearing headscarf in universities. The law in 2004 was only for public schools. Right. But in Turkey, it was covering both public schools and private schools, both schools and universities. And in Turkey, they went even far enough to declare a woman, any woman politician, a woman was elected, they didn't allow her to give, to take part in, in parliament. So even for adult women, there were such restrictions and discrimination. And given the fact that 60% of women in Turkey wear some sort of headscarf, this is a very discriminatory policy. So then... I look at the historical origin of these two types and argue that historically in the United States, there was no ancient regime, an old regime, where religion cooperated with monarchy. That's why the elite was much more friendly with religion. Whereas in France and Turkey, since the Catholic Church in France and the ulema in the Ottoman Empire allied with the monarchy, the Republican secularists became assertive secularists against both the king or sultan and the Catholic Church or the ulema. But this historical path can change. So history tells us continuity, but change always possible. But unfortunately, in Turkey, assertive secularists, Kemalists, did not allow a moderation, a middle way. They refused my proposal and other proposals. And then pendulum swing back. Their radicalism brought an Islamist radical, Tayyip Erdogan. So, you know, every action creates some source of reaction. Yeah. And 
Kemalism, assertive Sikhism was a reaction to the Ottoman Empire and its Islamic legacy. Tayyip Erdoğan is now a reaction to Kemalist assertive secularism. And in the near future, I don't know whether I'll see it or not, but there will be a secularist backlash in Turkey. There will be a reaction to what Tayyip Erdoğan has been doing recently. Hmm. It's, it's interesting to hear you talking about that. And I think the, the, the remarks that you've just made have have similar sort of contextual importance to your book on on Islam authoritarianism and underdevelopment because I'm I'm hearing you talk about the importance of history and culture and society and the relationship between all these forces that play out in shaping the nature of of a particular issue be it secularism or be it the role of religion in the state so it's interesting to hear hear these sort of contextual parallels between the two different projects I agree yeah definitely and uh... That's why in my new book, I look at four main classes, the state authority is first class, then religious leaders second, then intellectuals the third, and finally economic class, you may call them bourgeoisie. And therefore, in order to analyze any political problem, you have to examine how social forces, economic forces, clash, cooperate, yeah. and that's the way to understand the political phenomena. Sure. I, I, I really like the subtitle to the book, Ahmed, uh, A Global <laughs> and you. Historical Comparison. I think that's, that's really important here. It, it shows the, the sort of the implicit comparative dimension of your work, but it also shows that, that what we're dealing with differs across both time and space. And that those those socio-economic forces that you identify are are themselves products of particular times and particular places, and the the, the forces that shape those particular instances. But uh, uh, Ahmed, uh, please carry on. Oh, definitely, I agree. And let me tell you, the subtitle also explained that it's global and historical comparison because counterintuitively. I put the contemporary chapter in the first part of the book, Yes. then the historical chapter. I did the same in my first book, uh, primarily because I'm a political scientist, not a historian. Right. I look at history to follow the trajectory, to understand the pet dependence and the critical junctures. And I start from present, and sometimes present help us to understand history better, Sometimes vice versa, but I, I think both, both present and history are very important. And that's why the subtitle is Global Analysis. First, I put the 49 Muslim majority countries today into a global perspective. They are a quarter of all countries in the world, and they have a problem regarding the world averages of democracy and development. Then I look at their history and compare them with in itself, different Muslim cases, I compare them, but also a major comparison between the Muslim world and Western Europe from 7th century to modern times. Sure. It's it's really interesting that you've done it that way. It's really interesting that you've put the contemporary first. And it, it's, it's good to note that you do that because of your identification as a political scientist rather than a historian. But I think it adds a certain something to the analysis as well which is, is really rich and, yeah, it was, it was a different type of reading experience, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. But, Thank you so much. Ahmed, can you tell us then, what's the, the main thrust of the, of the argument? What is it exactly that you're trying to get at in your, in your research questions? Uh, as you know, Simon, in the literature now, there are those who blame Islam for the problems of Muslim societies and countries, from violence to authoritarianism to underdevelopment. Although Samuel Huntington and Bernard Lewis are very careful in drafting their arguments, they, are, they, they were important social scientists, but uh, at the bottom line, at least the public understanding of their argument is that Islam is the problem. And you can read Max Weber 
to a certain extent, not fully, but even you can read Weber in a way of putting Islam, singling out Islam as the source of the problem. That's one version. I call them essentialism. Some may call them uh, focusing on Islam ideas. That's one argument. The opposite argument was made by famous Edward Said and some other great scholars that they may call post-colonial theory. And according to post-colonial theory, Muslims are basically the victims. We should not blame the victims. They are victims of Western colonization. And colonization and Western colonial uh, ideology still survives, although the practical occupations ended. And that's the thing we should start our analysis, and that's the responsibility and blame should go on. I argue in my book that both aspects have problems. And in each and every chapter, I say, look, that's the alleged role of Islam, that's the alleged role of colonialism. And neither explain the question, neither answer the question. Uh, in my argument is that Islam is not the problem because from 7 to 12 centuries, Muslims were very progressive in economy, in philosophy, in social life. So Islam was perfectly compatible with development. And that's why essentialism is not uh, helping us to understand. On the other hand, the Muslim problems began much earlier than colonization because the Western colonization of, colonization of Muslim lands was around mid-19th century, a little bit early in some areas. But the problems already were there. Philosophical, economic stagnation were already there in the Muslim world much earlier. Then I say there should be a different explanation. Then I look at the main engines, the main motors of Muslim progress from the 7th to 11th century, and they appear to be two classes. The, the intellectual, independent, scholarly class, they may be religious or secular thinkers, religious scholars or secular philosophers, but the common characteristic of them for these five centuries was that they were not state servant. They were independent scholars and they helped Muslims to have philosophical and intellectual breakthroughs. Right. The other class is the merchants. The commerce and trade were the sources of Muslim scholars and philosophy and the merchants were the carriers of Islamic civilization. But after 11th century, these two classes, intellectuals and merchants, were dominated, suppressed, and marginalized by two different classes, state authorities and the ulema. State authorities existed before, but the ulema as state servant was almost a new phenomenon in the post-11th century Muslim world. So then basically, my argument is based on a sort of, sort of class analysis of four classes, and it's a critique of the dominant essentialist and post-colonial perspectives. It's fascinating hearing you, you speak about this, Ahmed. I've got so many thoughts, so many questions from my own work about, about what you're doing here. But it seems to me that, that from the 11th century onwards, which is, I think, where your, your argument really gains traction what you're what you're focusing on is is fundamentally politics it's it's the organization and the ordering of life it's it's the articulation and operation of, of sovereign power and the different ways in which states um, are organized and regimes operate using different types of power different understandings of networks different relationships to to solidify their rule I totally agree, and you, thank you, Simon, for putting it in a context of political terminology, and that's a very insightful way of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think 
this argument and analysis is also directly related to an area you are interested in, which is sectarianism. Yes. Because the argument is followed up by this question, what happened in the 11th century? Why 11th century? Because in the 11th century, there were Abbasi caliphs, and we know two of them played a major role. One was Qadir, Qadir which means powerful and able. The other was Qaim, and this father and son were the Abbasi caliph in Baghdad for about half a century. Very long-lasting leadership they show in Baghdad mm -hmm. in 11th century as Abbasi caliphs. So, for the listeners, let me briefly explain. So, there were two major Islamic empire and dynasty, first Umayyads, then Abbasids. Abbasids initially were militarily powerful until, let's say, mid-10th century. After that, a Shia group called Buwahids, these Buwahids captured the military power in Baghdad and many other parts of Iraq and Syria, but they allowed the Abbasi caliphs to stay in a symbolic position as kind of leader of Sunni Muslims as a religious authority or symbol. So there was very good combination or coexistence of the Sunni Abbasi caliphs and this Shia military force in Baghdad for about a century from 10 to mid 10th to mid 11th century. That was, in fact, the time of Muslim philosophical prosperity, productivity, intellectual uh, development, and it was a good moment for philosophers and intellectuals. But the Abbasid caliphs were not happy. They wanted to bring together Sunni military powers to get rid of this military force in Baghdad, Iraq, and Syria. Meantime, as you know, Fatimids, another Shia force and who claim to be alternative caliphate, control Egypt, even uh, parts of Arabian Peninsula, North Africa, all the way to Sicily. And another Shia dynasty, Hamdanids, were in today's Damascus and Aleppo. So, and another Shia force was in Bahrain and other parts of Arabian Peninsula. So, four or five major Shia forces were militarily powerful. So, Abbasid caliphs called wanted to bring together Sunni leaders, Sunni military force to destroy this Shia military presence. So the uh, Qadir, the father Abbasi Caliph, may declare a creed saying that those who criticize and say nasty things about Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, were infidels. Those who argue that the Quran was created were infidels. And by doing so, the sh caliph declared Shias and Mu'tazila, the Muslim rationalist philosophers, infidels. That was an important moment in Muslim history. An Abbasi caliph was making something really original and with very long-lasting legacy in the future. And that call was resonated and to some extent accepted by Turkish military force in Central Asia, Sunni Turks, first Ghaznavids, Mahmoud of Ghazna, then the Selçuks accepted the call. Selçuks came to Baghdad. They coalesced and allied with the caliph in Baghdad. And a third force, in addition to this Arab caliph, Turkish military force was the Persian bureaucratic class, Sunni Persian bureaucrats, especially Nizam al Mulk, the prime minister of Selçuks. And they created a model, a model of Sunni orthodoxy, which was 
propagated by the Nizam and Mulk's network of madrasas called Nizamiya, which produced Ghazali as the genius and the most important Muslim scholar of the time, maybe all mm. times. And then Ghazali attacked Shia, Ghazali attacked philosophers, Ghazali attacked Mu'tazila, the rationalist theologians. And this model of ulama state alliance, therefore, was built in Baghdad in reaction to Shia military presence and dominance as a result of the combination of Abbasid caliph, self military force, and Persian bureaucrats. Later on, Saladin brought this model to Syria and Egypt. And then it became the model of Ottoman Empire. Safavis took its Shia version in today's Iran. Mughal Empire, to a certain extent, imitated ulema state model in India. And today, that's still the dominant version of religion-state relations in the Muslim world. You can see sign of it in Diyanet, in the Ottoman Empire's legacy in the Turkish Republic now. You can see traces of it in the relations between Egyptian military and LSR in Egypt. So that's the ulema state alliance. That's the change in the after the 11th century. And it definitely has a root and reason in sectarianism because the model was created in reaction to, is a Sunni reaction to Shia power. But I think that's the fundamental point that that we must remember, Ahmed, that it was a it's not based on necessarily this idea of an ancient fundamental hatred of of the other, but the politicized, securitized other that that sort of started to emerge out of geopolitical movements back at that time, which is what I think your book does really well to to locate. It contextualizes all of these these decisions and all of these move, movements and indeed moments, which is I. Really fascinating. I totally agree, and thank you for this parenthesis and explanation, clarification, because some listeners, some friends and readers may think that my argument is just a path unbroken from 11th century to present. No, there are always some back and forth changes, revisions, adaptation, and politicization yeah. is the key term, politicize Islam. So two things. First... The early Islamic history was very different. For five centuries, Muslim philosophical and economic prosperity and progress was uh, based on a a contribution from people with very different backgrounds. Sunnis, Shias, agnostics, Zoroastrians, Christians, Jews, all of them, it's like the United States today or Hellenistic civilization that accepted the contribution of people with various backgrounds. That's why Islamists today, when they argue that, oh, in the first five centuries, we Muslims were very pious, we were Orthodox Sunni or Orthodox Shia, that's how we succeeded. They're wrong. It, the early Islamic achievements were not simple result of piety of religiosity. No, it's a result of open-mindedness. It's a result of cultural diversity. It's a result of cohabitation of various people with different backgrounds. But at the same time, you know, the 19th century French thinker Ernest Renan, he was also wrong arguing that early Islamic success had nothing to do with Islam and Muslims. It's all the Christians, agnostic. No, he was wrong too, because there were pious Sunni and Shias who contributed to this progress as well. But even after 11th century, there were moments of uh, changes and then action, reaction follow. For example, the Sunni-Shia sectarian tension became extremely politicized as a result of the tension between the two Turkish dynasties, Ottomans and Safavis. Hmm. They politicized and encouraged sectarianism. 
given their political agenda. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. And I could sit here and talk to you for hours about this, Ahmed. It's really, really <laughs> stimulating. But we've taken up a great deal of your time already. If I may, I'll, I'll have one final question. But I, I'm, I'm very grateful for this, Ahmed. It's been wonderful. Um, where do you see this, this sort of state ulema relationship going, moving forward? You've, you spent obviously a great deal of time talking about secularism elsewhere. But how do you see this type of relationship playing out in the future? If I can ask you to look into a crystal ball. Yeah, th- <laughs> yeah th- thank you, Simon. It's a challenging question. Let me say that an extreme secularist backlash is not the solution. There should be a moderate way of responding to this Islamic challenge. Otherwise, action reaction will keep going on. Any anti-religious secularist movement in the Muslim world uh, would not be the solution because secularist dictators for about a century or so throughout the 20th century, they didn't appreciate intellectuals. They did not appreciate the bourgeoisie as an independent class. They just attacked the ulama and make the state authorities even more powerful. That's the problem of Kemalist reform in Turkey. That's the problem of uh, Nasserism in Egypt and elsewhere, that my solution is to appreciate intellectuals and the bourgeoisie for modernist authori- autocrats. These two class are either unimportant or dangerous for their authoritarian rule. So secularist authoritarianism is not the solution. The solution, hopefully, is to have these two productive classes, intellectuals producing ideas, bourgeoisie producing economic value. Right now, the ulema state alliance normally is based on two unproductive classes, the state and the ulema. How come do they survive? They survive based on rent, rentier economy, basically oil and gas, or other sources of rents. That's why in my book I analyze the sources of rents. So the Muslim world has been cursed by the fact that their land has 60% of world's oil reserves. And from Saudi Arabia to Iran, from other Gulf countries to Algeria, these rents really help the survival of ulema state alliance without such an external resource it was very difficult for them to survive. Because of the rent, they did not have to compete. They did not have to produce value. Even in Turkey, which is oil poor, Tayyip Erdogan is aware of the fact that he needs rent to make his ulema state alliance or a version of authoritarianism survive. He is now selling Istanbul's lands piece by piece. That was the reason after Gezi event in Turkey, people of Istanbul didn't want to see a park destroyed and a mall built to replace it. But that's the mentality they have. They always need a rent, which means a gift of nature without production and laboring. So hopefully in the future, with with the declining role of oil and gas, the ulema state alliance will find less rent and the productive classes of the bourgeoisie and intellectuals may become more important in the Muslim world, which will help Muslim countries to reach more democratic ways of governments and more development socioeconomically. Yeah, well, we can hope, Ahmed, we can hope. <laughs> yes, exactly. But That's thank you. I um, from my crystal cube. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you for delving into it and gazing into the future. And also thank you for giving us so much of your time. It's been absolutely fascinating to, to talk with you about your work and I've learned a great deal. So thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. It's a privilege and honor to be with you and having this very insightful conversation with you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, as always, to everyone for listening. Until next time.